Hey, ladies and gentlemen, you're about to receive the world's first international medical podcast, hosted by three paramedics from different countries. Live from the UK, Finland, and Australia, this is Group Call. Hi, guys, and thank you for tuning in. Uh, today's episode is very special for a um, couple of reasons, and I will tell you more in, in a second. Uh, but uh, we're going to discuss queuing today. Uh, ambulances queuing outside of uh, ANIS or emergency departments, if you like. Is that a worldwide problem or maybe local problem? Are there hospitals that actually can manage it better or is it just the nature of the beast? And is queuing a new normal? Because, I don't know, like 2019, I don't remember queuing like this. And um, is it COVID or maybe it's something more to the game? We're going to discuss it uh, in the very international um, company today. But also, we want to talk about you guys, about paramedics and how queuing impacts you and not only your mental health and well-being, uh, but also your finances. Stay with us, Group Call Live. <coughs> A very special episode for a couple of reasons I said on the beginning. Uh, one of the reasons is that uh, Harrison uh, is not with us today. For uh, our viewers who knows Harrison, Harrison is an Australian paramedic, very knowledgeable chap. However, he is on shift today. Uh, Harrison, you are on night shift. Uh, stay safe, matey. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Silver today on board. Uh, Finland. Morning, sir. It's nine Morning o'clock in before. Finland. Yeah. yeah. I, li- uh, I like your, um, I know your, your new hoodie. Very cool. uh, thank you. And uh, straight from the United States of America, uh, Gina Lurie Wendy. Uh, hi, Gina. It's mm, one o'clock in the morning. Yes, one o'clock in the morning. Hello. So, uh, ladies and gents, uh, for those who don't know Gina, Gina is uh, a knowledgeable paramedic and a paramedic instructor uh, from the United States of America, uh, St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, she normally is present on the show um, as a recording, as a, she, she sends us the, the recorded messages uh, purely because she normally is at work uh, on this this uh, part of the night for her. Uh, but today uh, she made it and she w- she's with us. Um, are you in bed in your pajamas? Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I'm upstairs just kind of uh, chilling. I should normally be uh, either working or in bed. <laughs> cool. Uh, thank you for being with us. That's 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 amazing. Uh, ladies and gents, uh, let's discuss ambulances uh, queuing outside um, A&E's or emergency departments, if you like. It is quite significant problem here in the UK. It is... V- It varies locally uh, from hospital to hospital, uh, but not only from my experience, but also from um, reports of other paramedics and media articles, uh, I can say that in this country it's a huge problem. Now, time-wise, it is uh, very different from region to region, but usually it's one hour plus. But there are infamous hospitals um, that can keep you there for up to 12 hours. Uh, There is a specific hospital, I won't mention the name, uh, down south uh, of the United Kingdom, uh, where six to eight hours queuing is quite a normal thing, which is sad. Because again, um, in a moment, I will will ask um, Gina and Timu how it looks like in Finland and America. However, uh, I would say that Pre-COVID, I don't remember queuing like this. Yes, sure, there were some queues, but uh, I would say the two, three hours that was absolute maximum, and that was that was bad. Then all the media, all the newspapers, radio stations, tele stations were were absolutely in 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 rage and panic, saying all the ambulances were queuing for a couple of hours, and now mm. no one seems to bother because it seems to be a new normal. And when I speak to my colleagues, they, they, they just sat saying, yeah, it is new normal. Uh, but but I know that um, there are a couple of uh, countries or a couple of places uh, that actually don't have the same problem. Uh, and let's let's start with uh, let's start with uh, Finland, uh, Mr. Silva, how it looks like up there. So yeah, um, like I said before, we started this uh, as a spoiler. But so we we've had one instance of queuing 
in the entirety of Finnish EMS history that I know of, um, which was really recently. At the moment, the hospitals are really backed up because of like um, shortages in nursing staff and uh, funding and stuff like that. So it was probably one hour of queuing and that was that that, that made the headlines in the Finnish media and that was a big thing. But yeah, it, it is very rare here. Okay. United States of America, how it looks like that? Um, I'm not particularly sure about queuing. We have, so does that mean that they're in the ambulance the entire time that you're waiting to go into the ER? That's correct. So uh, ambulances are queued outside of the hospital and basically you, you treat your, ho- your your patient on, on board up to the moment when you are allowed to enter the, the um, A&E or emergency department. Wow. No, um, here in America, um, I don't recall any queuing. That doesn't mean that it hasn't existed, but no, for the most part, um, we pretty much go straight into the ER. Now, there might be times in the emergency room where a nurse needs to give us report or we need to um, be in, in triage, which is a front area, and wait to give report to that nurse or look for a bed, but not inside the ambulance not that i can recall but i'm sure if there was then um then it might be documented and might not be documented okay uh, that's united states of america at least st louis missouri uh, but we also have um, quite a broad view from uh, other countries and other parts of um, america other states of america um how does it look like worldwide uh, we asked this question on reddit and we got lots of answers, right, Timo? Yeah, yeah. That was like um, I I I saw that um in Canada in some parts they're queuing right, and then it depends on the states. I think a lot of people said that in in other states in the U.S. um there had been some queues um, but it's it seems like at, at least the nor- northern America is more thinking in the lines of we we like you take it inside the ER, leave it there, and then then it's the hospital's responsibility to find staff to care for. And like in Europe in general, I think we are much more careful with it. We don't we don't just <laughs> waltz in and just drop the patient there and say, okay, nurse, we've got one for you. Do you want to take it or not? We're, we're really? heading out. And I think in, in the UK, the system is a bit too polite, I think, should like be more like more forceful about having the hospitals take the patients sometimes to, maybe yeah to, to be honest uh, very recently uh, there was an information in the media that uh, um, one of the 11 ambulance services in this country uh, established kind of a treatment point at the hospital where ambulance staff were treating the patients brought by ambulance staff on the hospital grounds for hospitals and again, I'm 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 far away from saying that's that's now your responsibility and and bugger off because we we feel that we are responsible for for patient wherever they they are. However, I I, I have the same the same feelings uh, Timu, uh, the same feeling Timu, that we are slightly taking on our shoulders a bit too much, uh, but just by by looking at um, Reddit's uh, Reddit comments. Uh, Los Angeles, seven hours uh, queuing, and that's something incredible. Uh, Canada, sorry, um, that's California, California, five hours queues. That's something incredible. Whilst, yeah, here in the in the UK, um, especially southern part of the UK, seven eight hours. That's new normal, and that's that's quite sad. But let's let's ask Gina. Uh, what is so special about America that your queues either are not existing or are shorter than ours? Um, well, I know in America um, there's um, many different hospitals and hospital systems. I know that if FEMA, which is like our emergency management, um, is activated, there's like a different way to send and to deliver that patient in a FEMA deployment. So, like, if um, an ambulance service is contracted through a separate ambulance service to assist 
and they're using their national rules with the city or state that they're in. They follow FEMA guidelines to drop it off. So then that's probably um, like a queuing if, uh, if Los Angeles is over busy or um, kind of in a locked state, then they would follow that. But as far as like not queuing um we literally go in call report before we get there and i would say about um 10 to 15 minutes ahead of time now if it's like a level one trauma or cardiac arrest a lot of times um our dispatcher or um our supervisor will give them a heads up saying hey this is what's going on and then we'll call report um right when we can and then it's a courtesy to call but they strongly recommend it to say hey we have something coming in and we need a room appropriately now so in the United States, there's always a lot of ambulance abuse. Like we'll get called for three in the morning, morning for like something that could be treated at like an urgent care or a short care facility. And then that ties up that ambulance um, as well as that ER service. So what they do is they put some of these patients in triage, which is a front area where the nurse comes in and kind of like assesses each patient. And the bigger hospitals actually have protocols and physicians that are physically in the emergency triage room. And then from there, place them into a back different section of the ER into an actual hospital room. So there's different sections in ERs, like a, like a treat transport or like, a, like an urgent care, something small, easy that they can get out. And then a room for critical care patients. And then they have a, like a room for like respiratory and cardiac, like just a regular medical and or trauma that could be delayed. And then from there, that's how we we pretty much do it. A lot of times if we have to wait, it's for a bed or for a nurse or for actually a room physically because there, there is no room. Um, so a lot of times they might need to go to triage to start and then they'll go into the back when necessary. So I don't know how it is at your guys' area, but for the most part, if we give them a good heads up and let them know what we have and where we're going, we'll probably, most likely, if there is available bed, go to that location. If not, then we go to the front, check in. Yeah, so uh, in the UK, it, it, it looks, I, I think, pretty similar. And we also have something which we call a pre-alert. However, we pre-alert only time critical patients i don't know i'm uh, uh, mis um rtcs and strokes and so on so on so on the rest of the patients are not pre-alerted and at least in the service where i uh, where i've worked for uh, we were discouraged from uh, making courtesy calls we because we, we had something like courtesy calls a couple of years earlier but yeah we were we were strongly discouraged from uh, making them to hospitals so uh, yeah we don't pre-alert let's say normal or non-time critical hospital uh, patients and yes we 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 i feel that we are also slightly stretched and and under huge pressure from uh, from the members of public because we are called basically to everything uh, now uh, when the patient is brought to uh, the ane if there is a queue we either queuing on in the hallway or we are waiting in the in the ambulance with the patient now attendant goes to the triage nurse who normally is at the front desk and we we we, we say what what type of patient uh, did we bring and we are informed about the waiting time or no waiting time and then either uh, if that's less complicated less complex let me say patient they can be they can be dropped off uh, in the in the waiting room or if if they if they require uh, medical attention. Someone with them, uh, I for I know because they were given morphine or or, or, or they are on oxygen or or antinox or whatever. The attendant stays with the patient either in the hallway on the stretcher or in the back of the of the truck. But yeah, cues can be can be really huge. Um, and of course, yeah, pre-alerted patients are, are coming first, but definitely those patients are time critical. Uh, does it look same in Finland? Yeah, um, it's pretty much the same. I, I got to thinking that is it the case that we actually transfer more of the non-urgent patients to the A&E 
than what the what, what you do in in the stage gene. I guess um, that's what causes the, like, th- those are the patients that queue for us. Like there's there's uh, there's very little chance that in Finland and when I was working in the UK that a time critical patient would be queuing. Um, maybe it's different now um, than it was before COVID, but um, at least in Finland. You can always hand over a time critical patient, and the hospital may, will make sure of it. They might be like really full um, with other patients, but time criticals will always get in. That that's for sure. And and the, and the case that I was saying that we had with queuing was a non urgent patient. Uh, well, I, I don't know, but I, I'm I'm ninety nine point nine percent sure that it was a non urgent patient that was queuing. Um, so yeah, maybe. Maybe it's the difference in what we convey as well, because um, I know maybe like 80% or 70% of the patients that get conveyed are non-urgent or like um, sub-acute mm-hmm. in Finland as well as the UK. I mean, let, let's 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 be honest, Tim. You have like, what, 35 inhabitants in Finland? Yeah, yeah, pretty much 36 <laughs> um, and maybe 37 next week when a new baby is born. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah. no abuse, basically. Gina, do, do you know how does it look like from your perspective in, in America? How do you triage calls? Do you take ev- anything that comes in or it, the, the triage system is really robust? Because, may, yeah, Timo, maybe it's it's like we are taking everything or every single call and you guys are a bit more picky, if I may say. So um, we have an emergency dispatch system. Um, so, like, uh, um a call center, a call taker, um, or emergency 911. So they would, in the United States, we have 911. So they would pick up the phone and dial a quick, easy three number, and it would go to a call taker. And this call taker is an emergency dispatcher. So they have, like, short directions to kind of help give them um, medical care over the phone. But then... Another person on the other end is now trying to locate a, an ambulance and or a fire truck and or a police or somebody to get to that scene to get some to get help to that patient. Um, but another thing is, is now there's a transport unit and the transport side is like a private EMS agency. So if the hospitals are backed up and there's no rooms, they get a hold of this you know, tried bed placement, and then now we got to get an ambulance to that hospital to transport the patient to the next hospital or to wherever they need to go. And that takes some time. Um, that could be hours. Therefore, then it it kind of makes everything compact and kind of stuck. And so sometimes if a true 911 were to come out and everybody is in the ER waiting to give report or there's not enough trucks physically because there's so many calls pending, then it could be an hour to two hours before anybody in that region can respond to that call. So a lot of times we have munis that help other munis. So like meaning like if the area of St. Louis is backed up, there's multiple different like there's cities and and counties that will help each other to try to get those 911 calls served um so that uh that patient can be helped but sometimes it can be up to three it can be the worst i've heard it in st louis is anywhere from three to four hours wait for somebody in the 911 now that doesn't mean that it's not in los angeles way worse or New York, where they're way busier than we are. Um, and then that could be where that queuing of calls comes in, like you're behind so many minutes. Um, and that could be for the transport as well as the 911 side. So same thing with officers. Officers are very, very short here in St. Louis. So you could go and call 911 and not get an officer for four or five hours. So... Okay. It's and, pretty pretty rough, but, okay, but they, then, they make it work as best they can with the, the many resources that we have here in St. Louis. Now, I don't know about any other states. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, no, that's absolutely fine. Uh, my uh, my question is also about the dispatchers. Do you are you aware of any protocols for dispatchers? Let, let me let me start from the beginning. Are your um, call takers? Let's start with call takers. Are they clinical or are they non-clinical but trained? In, in, in taking calls? 
So they are clinically trained. So um, there's an actual certification. Um, the emergency dispatcher it can either be a call taker or a dispatcher, mm -hmm. and the and so there's huge regions and huge coverage areas that these emergency dispatchers work for. And so, say if somebody calls in with chest pain, so the dispatcher is going to say, um, "Okay, do you have any aspirin in the house? I want you to go ahead and take four baby aspirin unless you're allergic to it." They're going into great detail. These these people are highly trained um, so that if anything were to happen, then they can give them the next instruction. So they do kind of, it's almost like an EMT, but only it's made for um, call taking and then dispatching to the appropriate location and which ambulance would go here. It's specifically for that region or that muni, but the certificate is just, Okay. EMD, so it's a um, medical emergency dispatcher. Okay. So if if there's a if there's a non-urgent call, let's say there's a, I don't know, maybe an elderly patient that has been feeling unwell for three to four days and is now confused and off their legs, is like, will the will the call takers always dispatch an ambulance to every nine one one call, or will they like? sort of like um, handle it over the phone or do something something else like um, like alternate pathways or something like that? Um, so they would dispatch an, an EMT. Unfortunately, they're not like clinical or clinicians, but they are um, dispatchers. So you would have to still have that EMT come and assess that patient. So. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that, that's what I was thinking. And, I think Alex was also going for it with like, because in the UK you've got systems, and in Finland, all court call takers, like the emergency dispatchers, they will actually sometimes say, "Oh, well, you need to take care of this yourself. Uh, ambulance is not going to come take yourself to the nearest like primary healthcare center or take an, t take painkillers and sleep it off or stuff like that." Or it might get uh, categorized as low acuity and then get sent to the ambulance service and some of the ambulance services for example mine we also do uh, phone triage for these patients um, and it's kind of like clinical support desk in the uk um, where i was working there so i would call the patient and talk talk through the situation with them and i might recommend an alternate pathway or get them to self-convey or stuff like that so an ambulance would not get sent out that would be amazing. <laughs> he does the idea. That would be great. Finish way. Finish way. Um, no, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed with your system, uh, Timo, because I, I feel that we have quite similar setup, but we don't use it as often and as uh, as uh, we would like to. It's not. It's, it's quite robust, but we, for unknown reasons, we don't really use it. What that's 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 my personal feeling. Um, now, let's try, uh, talk for a couple of minutes about the impact because we now we know that the situation is is bad and most likely it won't change. Uh, I will ask you f about your ideas for future in a moment, but uh, let's focus on on paramedics who are actually stuck in this queue. Uh, <laughs> how do you feel it impacts them? Um, in Anyway, let's let's mo maybe start with with financial side of it. Are we financially impacted by queuing or not? Because yeah, we we, we got paid for overtime if oh, not overtime, sorry, for for the late finish if if we will do one. Mm. I think I think to, in terms of financial impact, um, I think it depends entirely on like what your life situation is. For example, for me, no kids living with a dog and a wife um if if i finish late um there's no I, I don't need to pay extra for childcare. i don't need to cancel my plans usually i don't need to do anything special i don't lose out on anything that i might have already paid for or I, I don't need to pay for anything extra what actually happens is i get paid extra um then it's a it's an entirely different like discussion like is is the extra enough to justify the late finish mm -hmm. Um, but in terms of just like pure money, um, I think I would be benefiting. But then obviously people with children 
might also lose, uh, like be negatively impacted by the late finishes um, in, in terms of finances, but also in other ways as well. Uh, also, if you would have a second job, I know it, it, it's not very common in, in, in Finnish healthcare. Uh, in, <laughs> I, I, I didn't want to be mean, sorry. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it, nobody does it. Nobody really does it. <laughs> in, in the UK, it's, uh, again, not common, but some people have uh, like uh, the second job or, 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 or private commitments, I don't know, uh, working as, a, as a either trainer for, for private companies or mm. uh, work in different uh, facility let's say, or different service. Uh, I know it's in, in Poland it's still very common to have three three jobs uh, and then go basically from one job to another. But then if you finish late, you cannot go to the other other place where you work. Uh, so you are, are impacted in, in financially uh, in, in, in a way, I would say. Uh, Gina, do you... Do you have a second job in the, or do you guys is it is it common to have a second paramedic job in in the US? Yes, uh so a lot of times EMS is still kind of like the wicked stepchild of uh emergency services here in the United States. So, um a lot of emergency services unless you're a paramedic firefighter, or police officer, or paramedic firefighter, you're not going to make that good money. Um, so a lot of us that work for private EMS or hospital-based EMS have like two or three jobs. Um, even then, sometimes the munis, um, which is like a good paying job, um, they might have like a second job just because EMS doesn't get paid that much. So if we're late and we're late to that other job, unfortunately, um, depending upon where they work, they might be okay with it. But you might still get in trouble. So like mm -hmm. one job, if I'm late, I get written up, I get in trouble for it. They don't, they don't care. Um, the other job, it might be a little bit different, but I'll still get a write up for it. So I can't be late. They, they really, they really don't care. They don't have any leniency, but that doesn't mean that other places might not. Other places might care, but unfortunately for the companies that I currently work for, you know, <laughs> Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, guys, uh, let us know in the comment section below how many hours you've been queuing recently, or maybe not. If if not, let us know where and, and, and basically why. Do you do you um, feel that there is a way to get rid of ambulance queues? Uh, let us know in the comment section. Uh, I said that we will, we will discuss not only the financial impact on paramedics, so let's think about mental health and well-being uh, side of it. I feel that we cannot plan anything uh, if 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 you if after the shift if you mm. are on the shift let's say I don't know 10 or 12 hours you cannot I don't know invite your partner to to the movie you cannot make sure that you you you, are, um, you can do your childcare you cannot basically plan anything and that's not really great for your well-being because you never like you you have to book the whole day for this commitment let's say which is work and uh, in, it, it impacts your family as well and your relationship does it do you feel do you have the same feeling yeah yeah for sure um in finland luckily um we have been discussing the late finishes now and the consensus is pretty much that even like the most acute cases in ems are not what not what what's called like a um um like an emer like a, like a uh, how do you say it's like it's it's not something that you can prepare for like the, mm -hmm. the the system can prepare for it it's not uncommon it happens like um resuscitation so like you know like cardiac arrests they are normal for us so even if it's really acute and it needs a crew straight away it's not something that you can't plan plan for so in term like th they've said now that the the provider all of the the system uh and the um but the employer needs to account for that. It's not the employee's job to stay late. It's the em employer's job to find a new crew. So they will have to get extra crews um, and then switch on the fly or something so that we can finish early. But I, I definitely think that all late finishes, be from queuing or be from getting sent to a really urgent job or whatever, um, does affect 
the mental health. And I also think that the queuing is especially, because I remember in the UK when we were queuing, uh, dispatch would be calling, like, can somebody clear? We've got 10 uh, red jobs waiting mm-hmm. for an ambulance. Like that's that's like a huge, huge ethical burden on yourself. Like how, how do you feel that you know that there's 10 people that need you and you're just stuck in the ambulance treating this patient because the hospital can't take them in? Uh, and that's that's like a really big burden on you. And as, as, especially like cause I know paramedics have like really high um, ethics and like work, work, work ethic and morale and everything. So it really affects that a lot. So, yeah, there's, there's lots of negatives from it, um, be it from life finish or, or the queuing. And to- like frustrating. Mm, yeah, exactly. It's really frustrating to just sit there and wait and hear about these jobs that need an ambulance. I will I will top it up uh unfortunately because it, you you both guys you you both are involved in educa- medical education and teaching so do I and uh, I had a chat with my students who are also frustrated not only for those reasons mentioned by Timo but also by the fact that they don't get enough exposure because they they supposed to have I don't know 10 10 12 30 40 shifts on the truck and then instead of treating patients they are just stuck in the queue uh, and yeah. uh, and basically what what you can do and you, there are some some ideas like like oh we can we can always learn or or, or we can always like I don't know, stroll through through books and stuff like that but on the other hand if you are with the patient your patient needs your attention so mm. you should not be learning so i'm sitting with the textbook next to the patient who is actually on board of your truck and needs your attention uh however however um very recent uh article from i think it was the telegraph um mentioned that patients uh, watch netflix on their phones whilst waiting to be to be admitted to the hospital so maybe students can uh, go through the textbook but again we all know that going through the textbook is nothing like a contact with the with the living patient and actually doing your job, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Now, uh, last last thing, guys. Uh, what are your ideas for uh, for 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 to, to tackle the, this this um, problem? Uh, before I, I I will I will let you uh, talk. Uh, I just want to say to our viewers that prior to the show, uh, I've contacted. Um, College of Paramedic of Paramedics. I've contacted and uh, Unison and GMB, so two biggest uh, uh, unions in the UK, uh, asking them to come and join us and to actually uh, let them um, voice the, the the concerns and and show what they do for uh, paramedics to actually support them and tackle this problem in. Uh, in liaison with the hospitals, but mm, unfortunately, unfortunately, no one found found the time to uh, actually share their thoughts with us. Uh, just saying. Uh, so, uh, Gina, uh, do you have any ideas? Do 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 you did you observe any good uh, mm, system solutions, or maybe you just have something in the in the back of your head that y- you think could help in solving this this queuing? problem the qm problems like it sounds like it's pretty intense over there if you guys are waiting for six to 12 hours to even get into the door to to be assessed so are you guys not even communicating with the nurse or the hospital whenever you're in this ambulance the entire time so yeah, when you when you in, in England when you are bringing uh, the patient to the hospital, okay, let's start from the beginning. You normally have uh, the the computer with you, like a like a tablet, which is called EPR, electronic patient report form. And uh, when you fill it in and you tap the, the 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 location you want to take the patient to, the hospital can see it straight away. So as oh, soon wow. as you will you will tap, you will choose a hospital from the list. Bosch. They can see it on their screen, and they they can uh, flick through the paperwork 
electronically and see exactly what you are bringing, what the patient, what is the pay ops uh, of the patient, previous history, blah, blah, blah. Everything is in the computer system, all right? When you actually get to the hospital and you click at hospital button on the computer, they should see it on the screen with the exact time when the when the truck arrived. Now, uh, when you, you normally you park at, uh, in front of the hospital and you go to the triage nurse and you say, your call sign and what type of a patient you just brought. And if that's time critical patient, of course you should pre alert and then you more normally you are taken straight in. Uh if not, the nurse may tell you, okay, the queue is over there, please go and, and, and queue there. Now in that's the that's the communication we have. Of course if the patient will deteriorate, we should make them aware that the patient deteriorated and and um and uh, we we should jump the queue, let's say, uh, and that's all. Uh, there's one more thing I I need to mention that because otherwise my colleagues will be will be really cross with me because uh, what ambulance service established in the UK is so called halo, so hospital liaison officer, and uh, if there is a huge queue, we can send an ambulance officer to the hospital, and uh, the ambulance officer takes let's say takes over kind of a responsibility over triage nurse so uh, the officer will take the patients from you and make notes and stay with those patients sometimes if his office if officer is not available again again blah, blah, blah. sometimes if the officer is not available one of the crews will be haloing so they will be triaging patients for the ambulance service but again what i feel is kind of a pathology that the ambulance service works on the hospital grounds to support a hospital. Uh, again, we are trying to make the best for the patients, and that's absolutely fine, but it puts lot, lots of, of pressure on, on our crews, which I feel is kind of uh, unfair. So that's how it looks like in, in the UK, uh, Gina. Okay, so they, yeah, it just sounds like you guys are just taking so much on of the patient's care. Like, you guys are just, like, in all of it in charge of it and so here in america i think that um, maybe the use of like a triage front desk or somebody that's sitting up front in the emergency services might be beneficial because then that gets those trucks on the road so you go there and you hand off communication to a nurse where this is kind of almost like almost kind of like staging if you think about it or queuing so these patients that are brought in by ambulances kind of wait with the common triage nurse and then that might be queuing so if you think of it like that that could be like the patient still in the queue of the waiting list and if that's the case there's been hours 24 hours 72 hours of people in the waiting room in a trauma er for somebody that went there for something small um but it those people that need those gunshot wounds those um strokes those heart attacks those um things that are high acuity those patients would go back first and then the rest that could be delayed maybe some treatment out front kind of like uh, drawing labs and x-rays and splinting and things like that to the point where when they go back into a room, into a hospital room, and they're actually reassessed by the emergency room physician, then uh, they can get out of there pretty quickly. But maybe that's something that to think about. But if the cues are kind of like if you're stuck in this ambulance, maybe setting up, like you said, somebody outside kind of helping sort through these patients so you guys can get back on the road that would that would be i guess a good thought thank you timu uh yeah i'm i'm smiling because i'm thinking like gunshot wounds in the uk or finland's like th there's there's none <laughs> there's never any <laughs> there's there's no gunshot wounds in europe well there is sometimes but very rarely anyway i i think i think it's a part of a larger problem um so in Finland, the, the reason why the A&E gets backed up, and I believe it's the same for the UK, is because the um, the wards in the hospital are backed up. And the wards mm -hmm. in the hospital are backed up because um, like nursing homes and places that can continue the care um, onwards, they are backed up. So it's, yeah. we, we're just like... It's it's a bowel of, of like bowel obstruction, but it's all all the way up to the stomach right now, and the stomach is the A and E, 
Um, so you're there's, going out the mouth. <laughs> there's, there's so much backed up already that um, we can we we can push the responsibility onto the hospital and onto the A and E. Um, but is that really fair? Because it's not their fault that they are so backed up. I think UK with the halo system where the ambulance, there's the, you know, there's um, an officer that takes the patients and then queues in the hospital is helping somewhere. Um, but in addition, like in, in general, I think what needs to happen is um, the governments in, in the UK, in Finland, they need to fix the um, the primary healthcare side of things. They need to fix, um, like they, they need more beds in the continued care, nursing homes, residential homes, stuff like that, so that patients can actually move through the the specialized hospital and they are not queued up in very specialized care. Um, and then in addition to that, I think ambulance services need to triage better. We need to uh, we need to draw a line like, okay, these patients will not get an ambulance. They need to go to the primary care um first themselves and then also even if we respond to something we can say oh this patient does not need to go to the hospital this is going to be a cm3 we're not going to convey we're not going to offload this patient to the a e um so like limit limit the intake mm -hmm. and make the output better basically that's like a tldr <laughs> With uh, the United States, we have something similar. We do triage the patients, and then if they, um, if they're able to stay at home, if they if they um, are medically cleared, we inform them, hey, you know, this is what's going on. But we'll take you to the hospital anyway. But you could be waiting twelve hours um, to get back into a room, and then they'll a lot of times um, just be like, okay, I'll go to an urgent care. Well, here in the United States, which that's a smaller, like a in and out hospital or in and out ER, um, a lot of things that um, can go there is like arms, scrapes, breaks, strains, things like that. Something flu testing, easy. Um, but we are not allowed to drop off there. We have to, as an emergency provider, we have to take them to the ER. Now, there's community paramedics that are able to do a perform a medical screening exam. And then if they don't need to go to the hospital, we'll be like, sorry, you don't need to go to the hospital. This is what you need to do. Follow your physician, get a hold of your physician, and then here you go. And then they can turn them away. Hmm. And then I we think, can go on. Yeah, but not everyone has that. I, I think in general also, like what you said, like you... Like saying you don't need to go to the hospital. Oh, sorry, you, you, yeah. It's like it's also like health education for the the public as a whole. Because um, in Finland, like obviously, I I can just say we're not going to take you. I don't need to try to get the patient to agree to not go. I can just inform them uh, mm -hmm. you're not gonna you're not getting on my ambulance. We're not taking you to the hospital. Here are your instructions. Follow this. But I I think in general it's it's so weird weird that we have to. Like I have to tell the patients that sorry, you're not going to go to the hospital. Like, how is that a bad thing? That's a that's a freaking good thing. Like, you're not, you're not sick. You're you're not so sick that you need to go to the hospital. That should be a positive thing. But in, I think in healthcare in general and the, the general population think that it's a bad thing. And that's that's a health education thing for the population as a whole to get them to realize that going to the hospital is not a fucking good thing. It's a bad thing. <laughs> True, but uh, do you think that the part of the problem is that some patients don't see us as professional enough to tell them you should yeah, not yeah, go, sure. they want to see the doctor rather than just yeah. a paramedic or just a technician, uh, which is sad because we, 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 not being doctors, we are still highly medically trained. But yeah, I, th I think... I think EMS is still a bit too young in, in like in worldwide, pretty young, um, younger in Finland than in the States and UK for sure, but still young all around. And I think patients still think that it's basically we give oxygen, we give them blankets and then we come away. <laughs> kind of. yeah. So yeah, they, they are drivers. thinking. Ambulance more. drivers, Mr. Silva. Yeah. Yeah. Sick people. <laughs> transport. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I think that um, a lot of people abuse our system, too. Um, I think that doesn't help, uh, especially here in the United States, 
of say if uh, somebody grandma wants to go somewhere and grandma's actually like 45 and she does drugs and her drug dealer is near a particular hospital well I'm gonna go to this hospital because I'm having abdominal pain she'll go to the hospital sign out AMA and then go to her crack dealer mm. it like it happens all the time or they they want to go there for a ride and we're not an uber but they make an excuse that's medically needed to be assessed so therefore we have to take them to the hospital if they want to go to the hospital because if not then that would be against the law um so we're kind of stuck with the abuse of our system and um until we are able to say hey no i can't take you um then we're gonna continue to be abused yeah which is a sad point to make in the in the end of the show but i still feel that uh, as an ambulance service we should uh, work better with the hospitals to actually draw a line saying guys we will do everything for our patients but that's that's the that's the line in the sand where we actually need to step back because of our own welfare um and with that being said Thank you so much for watching, ladies and gents. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Uh, Ginella Rivende, straight from uh, USA. Uh, Thank you for watching. <laughs> straight from Finland and Alex Hefner. This was Group Call Live. See you next month. Thank you, guys. Thank you.